<laughs> Great. Um, so um, thank you for coming. Welcome. And I thought I would actually start with a little background of myself. Um, I actually decided to uh, be a nurse working overseas when I was in second grade. And I was walking down Main Street. Remember when, Peggy, when we had the band that would lead us down street? Went to Mary Hogan for a, for a Halloween party, and I was dressed as a nurse. And I made my decision. I'm going to be a nurse overseas. <laughs> so then I went to, um, actually, I, I actually went to, we went to nursing school, nursery school here, right? Yes. I think we went, we did. Yes. So in the Ilsley Library, we started. Yeah. Jimmy Egan was with me and Peggy and Larry. <laughs> We're all classmates. And so we went to nursery school together, went to elementary school um, and high school. And then, uh, because I wanted to be a nurse, I went to UVM, graduated, and from there, and then I went, o I went over to the West Coast, to Seattle, for 20 years, and I got my um, nurse practitioner in women's health care, because I figured that would be the one that I'd need overseas. So I was always thinking overseas. And, uh, but when I did get my um, nurse practitioner, I worked at a Planned Parenthood for years, and then I kept trying to get a job overseas, and everyone said, you have to have your master's in public health. I didn't want to get my master's, but I thought, okay, that's what I have to do, big barrier. So I did. I got it at UCLA. Then they said, oh, you need experience. I thought, oh, no. So I didn't want to do Peace Corps at that point. So the um, University of Michigan came up with an internship program. They sent me to Thailand <laughs> for three and a half years. Yes. And I worked with the Ministry of Health. I lived, w I actually was housed in the Ministry of Health, was their guest, and um, developed a uh, well, improved their well child clinics with the government. And uh, that was my first. And then I went from there. Came back at age 60 and said to myself, I'm never going to go overseas again. I'm here to stay. I think you remember this. <laughs> and, um, I got called into Tanzania to work for a year, stayed six years. <laughs> and now I hope to go back for another two years. So I think I'm incorrigible. I think I really love the overseas. But meanwhile, I took a hospice. I'm surprised Priscilla's not here tonight, but I did just complete the hospice volunteer course um, uh, this month. So when I come back, I'm going to do hospice. That's why I like to do that. So um, I went, um, for the last six years, I've been in Tanzania. Jim gave me this little thing. I hope I can use it. OK, so I spent six years here. And I worked with, um, the funders was Columbia University. OK, so actually how this goes, and Chris was asking me, the funds actually are US funds that comes from um, Bush actually started it when HIV AIDS was so terrible overseas and everybody was dying. We couldn't keep up with the caskets. We yeah. were burying it, so many people. It was a real disaster. And actually Bush came in and came in with big money to help treat and prevent HIV AIDS. And um, so uh, PEPFAR is still going on, PEPFAR funds. And those funds are are distributed among USAID, which has an agency in many countries, and it's also was given to CDC, Center for Disease Control. And they gave it to Columbia, so Columbia managed their funds. So I was under CDC, but um, Columbia was my boss. And I was there, the, pro, the cervical cancer screening I worked on from 2010 to 2015, but I actually started there working on psychosocial support groups for pregnant HIV-positive women. Uh, but then the Tanzanians took it over, it's sustainable, went on, and then I moved into cervical cancer screening. So here's Tanzania, and you can see in relationship to Kenya, Mozambique, Zambia, the Congo. And I love this picture because it shows you how big Tanzania is. I think it gives you a perspective. And there's... Um, 50 million people living there. A third are Muslims, a third are Christians, and a third is indigenous and Hindu and, and many others. So, um, and it's a very beautiful uh, place to live. Um, what else I want to say about it? The, um, I want to go into, it's divided into regions. 
there should be 21 regions, and um, they took all the PEP, the people, um, let's see, how do I explain this? So there's many partners in Tanzania who are working on cervical cancer. However, I was one of the first to start. Um, and the government divided all of us um, par uh, partners, like Elizabeth Glazer, Pediatric AIDS Foundation, um, Lutheran World Health, um, um, uh, Japigo, gave us different regions so we wouldn't be duplicating efforts. So they gave ICAP to work on HIV AIDS. So these were all HIV AIDS partners working under PEPFAR, and they gave ICAP three regions. Is that clear? So anyway, we got three regions. So we were responsible for HIV AIDS in Pwani, which included Mafia, Zanzibar, and Pemba. And we were given Kagera and Kagoma. And I just wanted to show you, because I feel very lucky that we had these three regions, because I lived in Dar es Salaam and worked with the government there. But when I went to the regions, I flew to Mwanza, and I had to take a tiny, tiny plane across the Lake Victoria, which was gorgeous, uh, to Bukoba. And then I worked in this whole region. We had um, 10 sites here. And then uh, we worked in, so I, then I took a direct flight. I could take a direct flight to Kagoma. That was about a four-hour flight. And um, for a while, they didn't have a good landing strip, but now they do have a paved one. So I've been through several airplanes and <laughs> different airstrips. But I stay in a hotel on Lake Tanganyika. And I like to finish my work at 5 so I can watch the sunset over Lake Tanganyika and all the fishing boats coming down. And then I look across into the Congo to all the mountains. So there I sit with my beer, 5 o'clock, sunset, fishing boats, Congo. And so I have to say I was very spoiled. And, and Kagera too. We had, Bukob was looking out over Lake Victoria. Um, so, and then Pawnee is right along the coast, so it's a, it's a nice area. So that's... Um, now, every, every, every one of us was on HIV AIDS. When we were assigned the region, we knew what the percentage of, of uh, HIV was in that area. And so you can see I wasn't in the high, the high concentration or percentage of HIV AIDS. That's in Naringa, and that's the... The Polos are here. They're daughters of Peace Corps right now. Moringa, and that is a very high 15.7% HIV AIDS prevalence. So they're in a, that's a very high risk area. Um, Kagera is 3.4% prevalence. Kagoma is the lowest, one of the lowest, 1.8. And Dar es Salaam or Pwani is 6.7%. So I was in the medium and low um, regions that had HIV prevalence. So. Um, So I just wanted to, I, I couldn't stand not showing you how beautiful Tanzania is. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures. That's um, Kilimanjaro, beautiful. Um, this is the ocean. We had um, all these dows would go through, of just beautiful Indian Ocean. Um, this is Kagera, where I worked, and that's Lake Victoria. And I actually um, had my guest house was right up in here. The hospital was down in here. And this was the sunset from my guest house in Kagera. <laughs> so I was pretty spoiled. And um, I uh, actually, my friend Helen here came out to Tanzania and we went on a lot of game drives. And this was my favorite lion. It was just gorgeous, this amazing mane. It felt like it just been to the hairdresser or something. It was just, <laughs> oh, I, I don't know if you know Aslan. A lion in the Narnia series, but this was Aslan. <laughs> it was a gorgeous lion. He walked around, strutted around. He had a lot of uh, females around too, but he had walked off a little bit from them. And then um, there was a lot of the green turtles, and um, they would announce when the turtle hatchings were happening. And I went to several um, turtle hatchings, and just all these turtles come out of their nests and run for the sea trying to get away from all the birds of prey or uh, anything that might eat them. And it was just amazing watching them running for the sea. Incredible bird watching. Um, that was 
fun, and then we had a lot of, these are non-poisonous. I had to put this in for my brother. He's a herpetologist. <laughs> I could not put in something like this for him. <laughs> and this, we had a lot of beautiful native plants. I could have done tons on plants, but I just thought I'd put in a native plant. That was pretty. And then we're kind of known for the Maasai, and the Maasai jump. They love to, this is their competition in their ceremonies. They jump. So it's very comfortable. Colorful and many of these Maasai will be in Dar es Salaam. They come in, to, they work in. It's, it's it's sad to see them actually working in Dar es Salaam to earn money. They're always in the low paying jobs because they can't speak English, they speak Ma. And um, so they are like uh, car attendants or they actually do hair braiding. Um, and just the men come, the women, then the money goes back to their women. So you don't see many women. Um, and then sometimes you see them walking somebody's poodle or something. It's like, they're supposed to be walking lions, not poodles. I don't know. It's sort of sad when they come to the city. But they come to earn money and then, then go back. So I just had to share with you the beauty of, of that. Now I'll go ahead and into the hardcore. Why did we do cervical cancer screening in Tanzania? Well, it is the leading cause of cancer mortality uh, for women in Tanzania. And um, 40 years ago, it was the leading cause of cancer in women in the U.S. But once we started the regular pap test, I mean, still people have died, but it's very minimal. But it's very high here because they never did pap tests. They don't do any pap tests or any kind of screening at all. So you can see um, where it's dark is where you have a high risk of cervical cancer. And then where it's light, there's none. So you can see in the US, there's, there's very little. So, um, and in Tanzania, for some reason, um, it's much higher than like if you look at overall Africa or East Africa. It's really the leading cause. One of the highest burdens of cervical cancer is in Tanzania in East Africa, so it's quite high. Um, this really shows that this is, um, shows uh, the number of women that die um, in Tanzania is number one. So you can see this is cervical cancer. This is breast, and these are all the other cancers of women. So you can see that's number one. It's big, okay? So that's why we were there. And the thing is, cervical cancer is 100% preventable if you get early, if you're detected early and treated early. So, and the reason we got to use PEPFAR money, HIV AIDS money for cervical cancer, was because um, women who were HIV positive, their immune system was suppressed. So they were much more prone uh, for HPV, a sexually transmitted infection, and um, to get cervical cancer. So, and um, CDC said this was, the cervical cancer was an opportunistic infection uh, under HIV AIDS, that they were more prone for it. So it was the one that CDC said that it, we could then spend um, uh, PEPFAR funds for cervical cancer. But I think this year it's not one of the top priorities of, of this five-year cycle. But I think we've set it up pretty well, so we should be okay. Um, so uh, I think I just mentioned that um, cervical cancer mainly uh, by the human papilloma virus actually transmitted. And um, women who are at the greatest risk are those who have HIV or they've started intercourse early, multiple partners, they have STIs, smoking, interesting, mother or sister with his cancer. So it's the HPV virus that's sexually transmitted um, that we're looking at as the cause. And um, like I said, with HIV-infected women, um, you'll see the HPV more frequently. It resolves slowly. It's difficult to treat. And it progresses from precancer to cancer much more faster. It, m usually, precancer lesions, the ones we pick up, take 10 to 15 years to develop into cancer. It's very slow growing. That's why you can 
you can detect it early as precancer, and then you can treat it so you don't have to go to cancer. But for women who are HIV infected, it's much faster acceleration, hard to treat. Now, HPV, I just wanted to just make clear that HPV is something that uh, can resolve. Many women now get tested for HPV when they have their PEP test, and then it can resolve in two years. It kind of comes and goes. But if you have it and it's persistent, then it's something that can develop into cancer. So um, I just wanted to make that point. So how do you establish a national system? Well, first of all, when I, in 2002, only the, there's one nas national cancer institute, and it saw people for all cancers here um, from many countries, Zambia and around, plus uh, Tanzania. A third of those women had, had cervical cancer, and they started the screening in 2002, plus two big referral hospitals, so it started. At, at that high level, but that was it when I came. So basically, it was not done in your normal government health facilities. It was not done at all. Um, so 202, that's pretty late, starting cervical cancer screening. And um, then in 2008, uh, the Ministry of Health started and how this was a is the head of the cervical cancer screen and uh, she um, is an MD she's got her master from Australia um, and she's had many years of experience working in Ocean the Cancer Institute and uh, she's a very hard-working when we have clinic she, there's nothing beneath her she's marvelous um, and uh, then we have Dr. Mary Rose Giatis, who um, was hired by Japigo, John Hopkins, to be the advisor to the ministry. And um, also Japigo did a needs assessment to see what was needed for developing a program. And then um, in 2009, Grounds for Health from Vermont, uh, it's a nonprofit, they use coffee money. And they came to Kagoma, one of our regions, to start cervical cancer screening to prevent uh, cervical cancer in the women who are growing coffee. And that's where I learned how to do uh, cervical cancer screening using visual inspection with acetic acid, which I'll get to later. I also was trained with Dr. Huma, the head of the uh, Ministry of Health Reproductive Cancer Unit. So she and I, even though she was the expert on it, we both learned how to do training for women. So it was Grounds for Health from Vermont that trained us up. Then in 2010, that's when I really got involved. We were trained up, and so it was kind of the three of us, um, Dr. Huma, myself, and uh, Dr. Rhodes. She had also is a doctor with her MPH from Australia. The two were classmates in Australia. Um, wonderful women. Some people called me Linda Huma. I was always pleased. <laughs> and they would always laugh because I would come in Tanzania outfit. This is a Tanzanian outfit and they would come dressed Western. <laughs> we always went, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> and by the way, what I have on tonight is uh, Tanzanian material and I get most of my stuff tailor-made to fit. Um, I usually come with a skirt but I didn't have the leggings and it was too cold, so I just wear the top. Um, and this is from Africa as well. But I found that if I would wear this outfit, um, that the village people accepted me more. They already accepted Dr. Huma and Dr. Mary Rose because they were Tanzanian. But for me, if I wore what they wore, I was, they really loved it. They would laugh, they would smile. It was a big hit. So I always wore something long like this when I was out in the field. But we were the three. We were kind of the three sisters that worked closely together over the next five years. And like I said, we brought in many partners. So Japigo and ICAP, we kind of got started. Then we brought in Elizabeth Glazer. Then World Health came in. Uh, this is the Lutheran. IMA World Health is a Lutheran organization. Uh, then Gates came, gave money to Mary Stopes. 
and PSI, and they, they came on board. And uh, WHO had already been there, PATH had been there, and then Walter Reed got involved from DOD. So we started having many partners in the different regions. And um, I like to say that I developed um, what they call the standard operating procedures. It's been well used, so I didn't <laughs> know if I should put it out. But this, was, this, is, uh, this is the cookbook, how to start a cervical cancer screening in your region. So the government used it and gave it to the partners, and I usually walked them through it. And then they started. And so I got to know all the partners pretty well because I worked with them. And then they used our trainers and our people. So um, that was fun. Um, so how we went about this is we had technical working groups. And um, the most important thing was we came up with uh, Tanzanian service delivery guidelines. And uh, I'll tell you more about that later. We came up with a five-year strategic plan. We came up with those posters there. Those, uh, we call them IC informational posters, just to kind of encourage people to come in. Please come in, get screened, or these are the signs and symptoms of cancer or palliative care. And um, I was telling Chris earlier, that was a big job. We actually went out with the artists. They drew. We went into the field. We said, do you understand? They didn't. We went back to the artist. They changed it. New words went back. So it was back and forth to come up. That was a big effort, and it's all approved by the government. But it was fun. We used to call um, cervical cancer the neck of the cancer in Kiswahili, and they didn't like neck. They liked the door. So we changed it to the door of the cervix. So we, it's called uh, uh, Mongo La Kizazi. You can see it on there the door of the ear. So we even changed the wording so that people understood what cervix was. Um, and also we came up with uh, little handheld cards. Actually, this was my idea. And um, this each person got and it said when they were screened and um, when they need to come back or whatever. So everyone had one of these. Um, okay. So the service delivery guidelines were important because we don't, we, they want to standardize the care that's given all over the country. And we followed WHO guidelines. So this is all the WHO. So the first thing is um, Merck was interested in having us pass this because they wanted to bring in their Gardasil, their HPV vaccine, which has been started in, um, in one region. And now it should be rolled, start being rolled out in other regions for girls 9 to 13. Um, Gardasil is the one they're using. And uh, then the second, the second prevention, which is where I was involved with cervical cancer screening, it, it approved us using, okay, so this, it approved us using visual inspection with acetic acid. Acetic acid being your normal 5% vinegar. And um, so, this is actually almost as good as a pap smear. In fact, when you look at um, the specificity of the uh, sensitivity of the um, of VIA, it was higher than a pap. So, in other words, if you actually had a po you thought you saw a, po a positive result, which meant that when you put the vinegar on it turns white, this acetic white, and that's precancerous. So if you saw that, you is pretty sure that that was, in fact, uh, precancerous. However, the danger was is the negative. Sometimes they will miss. They'll call it negative, and it's not. So um, we, that's where the area of concern is. It's still close to a PAP, um, but not quite, quite as effective as a, a PAP in the specificity of the, of the test. So, and this is, to do a visual inspection with acetic acid is cheap, it's easy, to see the white lesions is easy, and then we combine it with treating, with freezing. So as soon as we see it, we treat. So it's see and treat, it's a single visit approach. We don't have to do a pap, they disappear, try to get them back, get them tested, I mean treated, so it's, you see it, it's white, you just freeze it, and they're protected. Um, so it was really important. And for the large lesions, we do a leap where you take a hot wire and you cut the lesion off, and um, it's a fairly easy procedure to do. Um, 
and then we developed a monitoring evaluation system, which is just getting going now. And I, when I, hopefully I'm going back for another two years and I'm going to check to see if, in fact, it's working. Because we can't even tell you to this day. I know how, how many people we've screened and how many people we've treated, but they don't have a national data. They don't have a national database. So as I left, they now have us in the national database. And that's why I call it a national system, because you have to be in over 250 health centers before you can come into the national database. It's all done now. We've got the registers. We've got the monthly summary forms. And we've trained all the data clerks. And it's all going into a national system. So, um, and then the UNAIDS was going to actually hire somebody for the government to help them compile that data. So I hope we can start saying how many women we've screened overall. Um, which is important. Um, and then tertiary care, uh, the man it has also the management of invasive cervical cancer, but you do not want to have cervical cancer in Tanzania. The, radio the machines are always broken, and uh, they just don't have enough people to manage. You may put on a three-month waiting list, and um, you don't want to go there. So we want to prevent, prevent cervical cancer. A third of the of the Ocean Road Cancer Institute, our cervical cancer patients is a huge load. And I told them, we are going to reduce that so you don't have any. <laughs> but <laughs> that's my goal. So this is what we used, um, American Garden Vinegar. And uh, Grounds for Health actually went out and tested all the vinegars. And some weren't 5%, but this one was. But thank God we could find it all over the country. Um, so that's the vinegar we used. Uh, this is actually doing the visual inspection with acetic acid. When I pre-tested my talk with my brother Jim, he says, how did you get in there? And I say, he says, what's the speculum? So I have brought for you to see, for you men who've never had a pelvic exam, what a speculum looks like. So she has put in a speculum. She has a headlamp, and she's looking at the cervix. And she's taking a cotton swab going in. Uh, she's dipped it in the vinegar, she's put it in, and she's swabbing the cervix. And she'll wait one to two minutes, and then she'll see whether it's going to turn white or not. So we use the headlamps because there's not much electricity, and it's easier just to get the batteries. And uh, so that's, that's the visual inspection with acetic acid. And then this is a cryo uh, machine. That costs about $1,500, that machine. But it lasts quite a while. Um, we have now somebody in the country who brings them in and repairs them. But for a while, we had to bring them in from the US. And that's a CO2 tank. There's only one source of CO2 in the country from Dar es Salaam. We have to bring those tanks in and set them up. And that's a hassle, I have to say. Um, this is the LEAP procedure. That's the LEAP machine. That costs about $5,000. Um, there's a little wire on the end of that pencil-like thing, and that wire gets hot, and then they just take off the lesion. The trouble is is that once you take the le that lesion off, it will treat it if you get it all, but you need to send it for biopsy to be sure it's not cancer, and the biopsies are expensive. And that's an issue. Um, and I, we have to talk about it later. Um, so rolling out the program, first of all, Grounds for Health did a demonstration for in there. We called it the demonstration sites. We learned from them. Um, then we came in and we expanded to other sites in Kagoma. Then, we could, then after you have your health providers doing this for a year, they've got the experience and the training. So now they can be trained as trainers. But we couldn't train anybody as a trainer until they had a year experience. So finally, we get the year down. And we've now got 12. We've got 12 national um, trainers in the country. And then we could start rolling out. So once we got those, we rolled out in other regions. Japigo rolled out, and we got the other partners to roll out. But it takes a while. And you have to get all the training manuals done and all the training materials. Who are the trainers? Pardon? Who are the trainers training? Uh, the other, mainly nurses. In fact, the lower level, the better, because other ones are going to stay there, and they're very dedicated. So, but mainly nurses. Sometimes we get clinical officers, kind of different levels, different levels of nursing, different levels of doctors. One lowest is clinical officer, then a 
then an assistant medical officer, then a medical doctor, and nurses or enrolled nurses, and then uh, BSRN nurses and midwife nurses. And, but it was the nurses that were the best. Um, so right here uh, were our Kagoma. I'm very proud of them. Um, here's Bernadetta. She is actually an AMO, assistant medical officer. And then this is Grancia, and she is a nurse midwife. And this is Leonarda, who is a, um, a, a nurse, uh, RN. Doesn't have her BS, and these, she was the best of all of them. She was a very good trainer. These three were the trainers. She, uh, she's ICAP hired. I hired her to supervise the Pawnee region. And then uh, this woman is the government official in charge of all the maternal child health programs in the region. She was lovely. And she took the training, and she's certified in both cervical cancer screening and cry. Then this is Rose. She's a master trainer. I kind of organize and facilitate. So um, this is a classroom that we train everybody in. And these we have to ha do. Uh, we have labs, so they all have to practice in the lab before they're allowed to go into the clinic. And uh, we we were the only ones that had black pelvic models, <laughs> and everybody was quite thrilled that they weren't white; they were black. So we had two of them. So we we're they're very useful to train people with. Um, Grounds for Health didn't have them; they used it, used Avoc, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> that was before the pelvic model days. <laughs> I wish I had a picture of that. It was interesting. Um, we've come a long way. So th then we also, to, to have a, uh, once we go into the clinic, we've got to mobilize lots of people for our students. And these were community mobilizers. And this is um, Lydia Tembo, the one who's in traditional garb. She was our uh, ICAP. I hired her, too, for, a clump for ICAP to work in Kagoma. And this is actually training community uh, women to go out and mobilize people to come in. They were very good. So then once they come in, they're, they, it's, it's amazing. Uh, by 6 o'clock in the morning, the clinic doesn't start till 8. We'll have like, a, like over 100 people waiting to, because they want to get a number. We only can take so many, and they want to get a number. It's really people want to be screened. This isn't a problem. And that, and they also figured out that if you're HIV positive, you got a priority. But they didn't know that. We tried to keep that secret, but somehow that didn't stay secret. So one woman said, <laughs> "You know, there's real uh, um, desire to be screened. It's not a problem mobilizing." Um, then once they get trained, they get certificates, and this is giving them. Their certificates as providers, and that's ministry approved, ministry certificates. We have, these are some more providers. We all had certificates, and we all had special t shirts. I got a donor, a Tanzania donor, who gave us money for these t shirts. Um, so I think I've alluded to the fact that for management and supervision, ICAP hired somebody for each region to oversee. So uh, Lydia. Uh, Tembo was the first in Kagoma, and she managed 21 health facilities. And she actually became a national trainer. Um, she also has the most adorable twins, and so every time I go up, I bring them presents and bring them from the U.S., and it's, I just adore her kids. Um, and uh, uh, Pendo Bukori has 12 sites in Pawnee Region. She's a BSRN, and... Um, then there's uh, Lavina Mwasiga, and uh, she was the field officer for, for Kagera. She was a nurse, BSRN nurse, and uh, she had a baby while I was there, and I got to name it. <laughs> I named it Molly after a friend of mine. <laughs> so, so we now have a Molly. Um, it's a lovely woman. So this is setting up a clinic. Uh, this is a health center. Um, actually, this is the one I took Helen to when she came out. <laughs> oh, you remember this one? <laughs> and uh, this is the inside. They collect the rainwater from the roof. 
This is a CO2 tank. This is a 25 kg, and they're hard, they're tough to move, and I hope that somebody invents something easier than these tanks to bring in the carbon dioxide. Um, we have to make our own swabs with cotton. We have a long stick, and we make our own swabs. And I became very good at it, actually. Um, some of the some of the health facilities didn't have sterilizers, so we had to buy them, and they weren't they weren't cheap. This one right here, um, and then so they sterilize in here. They have these little um, forceps, and then they put it in this sterile tray for the speculums. Um, this is a typical room set up, and um, I know I always do that. This is a, a exam table, uh, no stirrups. They just have to put their feet and move to the end of the table. This is a, what they call a Macintosh. It's a rubber, a rubber cloth that after each patient we wash down with Clorox. And hopefully that they bring their own wraps that they can put down. But um, anyways, we can clean this, decontaminate it with chlorine. Um, Here's a typical table set up. Usually we have tables, but if I had extra money, I'd buy them a trolley so they could move it around. It was much easier. Um, so for hand washing, a lot of times these sinks were there but no water. So we made up our own spirit. We had to take alcohol and glycerin, and we made our own hand sanitizer. This is our hand sanitizer. If they did have water, we had soap. And then this is the chlorine. This is the spray bottle for the... Macintosh, we sprayed down the table after each patient. So, um, so our overall achievements was that we established um, for and uh, all the almost all the sites runs for sites because they were dealing with coffee growers. They were really in the rural area. We made sure that they had both BIA and cryo, so they were doing single visit approach. So most of them could do both, right, at the same time. We trained 145 healthcare workers. We, uh, tra we supported the training for five trainers. Uh, Japago paid for the training under the Ministry of Health. And we trained 100 peer educators for community sensitivity mobilization. And we brought in two LEAP machines. And as I left, we brought in a LEAP machine for Kagoma so that each one of my regions had LEAP um, uh, so that they could get those large lesions taken care of. So the outcome was that our three regions over the time period that I was there, we screened about 50,000 women. and. Most of them that we screened were negative. They are, they are the easy ones to bring in. The positive ones are a little harder to bring in. But 35% were HIV positive. And then some were unknown. And they're only unknown because we didn't have the test kits. So we tried to test everybody. Because people who are positive had to come back every year to be screened. People who are HIV negative, three years. So we needed to know their status. So this unknown, this 11%, was usually because of the test kits. We're always running out of test kits. That's a problem. Then um, of those, we had about 3,000 women, or 6% did have precancerous lesions. The small ones we could treat, but the large ones had were large. And then we had 436 cancer clients. So you can see the majority of people treated and we can take care of them. There's a small percent that we, 1.4 percent we have to refer for other things. So we got this one down, this treating with cryo down, but this one's still kind of, we're working on it still. But at least when we screen, the majority we can treat right off. So this shows that the total, um, oops, where's my thing? So you can see the total VA positive is 3,000. Um, those that were eligible had small lesions, um, 2,730, and we treated 85% of those. And 80% is the gold standard, so we were above the gold standard. Uh, because some people, sometimes you don't have gas, there's other reasons people can't, they may have a bad PID, they go away, they don't come back. 
but 85% of those people we treated. And so I think we saved the lives of 2,300 people. And then we had to refer for large lesions, 245, and 16% actually got the leap, and we're still working on trying to get better access to leap. Um, so the challenge is basically is that once we train, is the high turnover of trained staff. Once we get people trained, they may get sick, they may get transferred, they may um, change jobs within their facility. So it was really tough to, to keep this training going. Um, and that's the biggest scare of sustainability. Uh, we didn't have enough district trainers. We would prefer to have every district have a trainer so that when there's a turnover, they could train. But the government has actually put that in their next year's budget. Um, the CO2 tanks are clumsy, heavy, hard to move. Um, and the cost of the transporting that is expensive. So um, that's an issue. And LEAP is not as, as, as accessible as we And the, any time you take a large lesion, you have to be in there expensive and can always pay for them. Um, in terms of sustainability, as the large international NGOs, we set them up, uh, set the, up the sites with all the speculums, the sterilizers, the trolleys, uh, everything they needed. And now what we've done is we've turned them over to local NGOs to maintain. So I've been very lucky. The local NGOs we turned over our sites to were very enthusiastic about cervical cancer screening. I was so happy. <laughs> and uh, also, the ministry is coming up with a new five-year plan with a budget to it. So hopefully, that will work out. I just wanted to show you, in Kagera, we turned over Kagera to uh, Management Bede Development and Health, MDH. This Alice, there in the middle. Um, Alice is a uh, Campaigning and through sites, so I'm very happy to hear she's very active, keeping Kagera going. The really good news was this: is that when I ended its funding, um, and we turned it over to THPS, uh, Tanzania Health Promotion and Support, we all have these acronyms. Um, they hired one of our people, ICAP. Pendo Bukori for Pwani. So our person we trained as an ICAP supervisor is now working for cervical cancer in a local NGO. So yes. And then this is Lydia, and she was hired for Kagoma to follow the cervical cancer screening, and she was trained by us. These are excellent people, so I feel very, very happy that that happened. That was a bit of, that was really. Um, so we had Christmas as the ICAP staff, so Anyways, Merry Christmas. <laughs> so anyways, that's, I, I don't know if things were confusing or made things clear, but um, why don't you go ahead and ask questions. There's just... Yes. Um, so is, is Tanzania the only place in Africa that this is being done? Yes, we're the only national program. The others have, Zambia has a small, a very good, but kind of a small national screening program. Um, and uh, Kenya has started. Grounds for Health has just gone in there too. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're the only ones that have a national program, so I'm real proud about that. But there's other countries that have different health centers or facilities that do provide cervical cancer screening. And it just depends on who's there and what kind of funding's there and who's got the enthusiasm to get it started. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a little worried about, um, I would love to start cervical cancer screening in other countries. I feel I have the expertise, but there's, right now there's really not a lot of funding for it because PEPFAR for the next five years has really focused on trying to identify key populations. They're really trying to eliminate HIV AIDS and really find the pockets of where it is and really trying to do male circumcision too. That's a big one to help prevent uh, the spread of the disease. So they're looking at drug addicts. They're looking at 
uh, MSM and men having sex with men. Um, that's what they call it, MSM. <laughs> and uh, so they're trying to really get down to key populations. However, key populations, according to the guidelines, need cervical cancer screening in the women. <laughs> so I'm hoping maybe they can slot it in under, under key populations. It's in their guidelines. But the, um, I think the different organizations are bidding for that funds now. And I know ICAP is putting in a proposal. So I just wish there was more money. Um, Bush, you know, started PEPFAR, and uh, then he still likes cervical cancer screening, and he has started uh, what they call the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon out of Texas uh, Institute, Bush Institute, and they are still getting money. Uh, Tanzania is a PEPFAR country, and we are getting Pink, ri pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon money. So we do have that coming in. Um, and so Bush... Uh, when he left, he set up this institution, and then Hillary Clinton said, okay, we're going to put $10 million into Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, in Texas into this institute. And then different drug companies are putting money in, and Susan Coleman is putting money in. And so there is one pocket of money, and we do get, we do get the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon money. It's $5 million a year. So that will also help move the program along. Um, and I'm hoping the government will actually put money itself into cervical cancer. Yeah. Um, the, the, what you are doing yeah. seems to be a very inexpensive yes. process. Yes. If a woman were to get um, cervical cancer, yes. how would that be treated and how would that be paid for? It seems as though what you do is very inexpensive. Yes. As um, it's expensive to the government. Once they have a biopsy, if it's a, if they have cancer, they're to get free treatment by the government. But the machines don't always work. I even heard one time they um, didn't have, they only had one machine, so they gave everybody half treatment. I mean, it's like, you don't want to have cervical cancer in Tanzania. Get out of there, go somewhere else. It's not good. I mean, they have good, they have good technicians and everything, but they just don't have the machines. I don't know why people aren't putting money into the machines. What they have a whole setup. What are the results if you have cervical cancer and you go through treatment? You go through treatment. Uh, depends, it depends on what stage and how far along they are. Um, they shouldn't even get to that point, but they usually come in very late to Ocean well, Road. You're yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I um I can't tell you the percent of the people that go to Ocean Road how many people actually die. I don't know, but people don't want to go there because they know people die, so they don't go there till it's too late, and then they're going to die. So they start that you're going to die if you go to Ocean Road. So they don't go early enough to get the treatment to move on. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of how it's working. So Dan. Besides the three regions that you were yeah. that to other Yes, with the other partners. We're in 19 out of the 21 regions. Yeah. We just don't have the data for how, I mean, Japigo can give us their data. I can take my data. Elizabeth Glazer, we can get their data. But there's a lot of other sites that are working that we can't get their data, so we can't tell you how many. But we're in about 19 out of 21 regions, and um, we have about 250 health facilities because you can't go into a national database so you have at least 250. So we hit that mark, yeah. But I only know my three regions because I'm totally in charge of those three regions. But we helped the other partners with how to set theirs, theirs up. So, so I, what I want to go back and do is this. So Queen's University may get money to use a smartphone so that I'm worried about the false negatives. If they have a negative, I want to be sure that it's a negative. And I'm, some of our sites have a low positivity rate, and I'm worried. Um, so if we had a smartphone, we take a picture of the cervix. So the nurse says it's this, takes a picture, sends it to a professional reviewer. And they did a, tr a pilot on this in Arusha, and it worked. So we're, we're trying to get money. It's called Grand Challenges Money out of Canada, Queen's University. And uh, she did the pilot for 250000 If it's successful, she gets a million to roll it out nationally. And she's asked me to be the coordinator for it. So I want to do that um, because I think it's that quality assurance piece 
that's missing. So what I would like to see with a smartphone is three things. One, when you have somebody newly trained, they only get a week training, so they only do tw 20 pelvics. So that if someone's never really done many pelvics, that's really not enough. So we usually don't even give them a certificate till they've gone into their site and done 50 more, and we go in and supervise them. But we can't supervise all 50. We have to kind of rely on the data, that the, the registers. So if we could give them a cell phone and say, OK, the next 50, we want you to be sending your results, and we're going to review you. And then when we feel confident they understand what that looks like, a positive looks like, then, then uh, we can graduate them. So I'd like to use it for new graduates, and the ministry has approved that. Uh, I'd like to use it for um, any site that has a low positivity rate. But I also think we can use it to train new providers. So if we've already trained somebody in a site, they can train somebody else, and then we can check that training with a cell phone. So we don't have to bring people to a clinic to do the classroom, the lab, and that's a big effort to do training. But if we could, once we train somebody, if they can train somebody else before they leave, and they could use a cell phone to check. So those are the three re reasons I'd like to use the smartphone. And then we could catalog and put into the cell phone uh, all the pictures, so maybe at some point they could just put in the picture and come back what it is. I don't know, but maybe that's down the road. But um, it would be a very, it would be very exciting to do this. Oh, I want to do it. <laughs> so I have, but now I'm supposed to wait till the 14th of December to find out if we got the money. I'm supposed to find out Thursday, this past Thursday, and now it's got to go through one more review. So I hope I know soon. It, um, that's why um, I deal with very smart, intelligent people who want to move a program. But you're right, when you get down to the local level, sometimes it gets hard to push a program. Um, I think my biggest obstacle, though, the biggest obstacle to move something is our procurement office to procure stuff and get it to the sites. So frustrating. There's so much. When you work with USAID money or CDC money or whatever, you really have to you know, get your three quotes and then get the best buyer and then get it and then send it out. And it takes forever. I think that's our biggest bottleneck. But both these people are doctors. Or no, she's a nurse. Jean is a nurse. And she has her master's from the Netherlands. And he's a doctor. Um, I don't know if he has his MPH or not, but I deal with really smart, tan wonderful Tanzanians. Um, so yeah, I think the slowness is procurement. <laughs> That's really how it hangs us. Is there education on the other side for to um, stay in a monogamous relationship and uh, is what they call it. <laughs> yeah, we promote zero raising. It's a, very, it's a very different culture. Most men and women have other partners. It's pretty common. It's kind of funny. Um, well, it's high just because they've never done any screening at all. I mean, that's why cervical cancer is high. There's been no screening since, since it only started in 2002. But places like South, A South Africa and Botswana have a very high prevalence rate. And I would think, but they don't really have a good program. So that they would have a very high incidence of cervical cancer. Where ours is sort of medium. Ours is overall 6% in Tanzania. But uh, the main reason for cervical cancer is they've never been, no one's been, had a pap smear or visual inspection, just nothing until 2002, and it was just at the national level and two regional hospitals. So. Are there any variations in the use of One third Muslim, one third Christian, and lots of them. Mm -hmm.
cervical cancer, having HIV. It's probably no data. <laughs> there are some studies on the, but I don't even dare quote them because I may quote them wrong. But uh, we, Ocean Road has done some studies looking at that. But I wouldn't want to quote them right now. Yeah? Yes. Oh, it's amazing the difference. When I started in Africa uh, before in Malawi, I was there when it was just being recognized. It hadn't really been recognized. It was starting to be recognized, and then it was really recognized. I mean, they could not keep up with caskets, really. They could not keep up with the caskets. So many people were dying. It was really amazing. It was terrible. And they, they, they were even thinking of cremation. And these are people who have always been buried, but there wasn't enough room to bury people. I mean, it was really horrendous. My coworker died um, of, of HIV AIDS, and he had a master's from Williams. He said, but he couldn't afford the drugs at that time. The ARVs, the antiretrovirals, were so expensive. And at one point, he was ready to just kind of sell his house and just go on these very expensive drugs. But he died before he could do that. Um, but with, uh, I mean, I have to say, um, now the, with that big PEPFAR funding, we now have drugs that are very cheap and free, basically free, to everybody. And oh, you don't see that anymore. Just do not see people. We had so many orphans, we couldn't even deal with the orphans. The orphan, because all their parents had died. The poor grandmothers were taking care of the kids. They were old. They could hardly feed the kids. It was awful. Now, just I w when I was up in, um, we were up in uh, uh, the highlands of Tanzania, there was an orphanage there. And uh, the orphanage was decreasing because uh, everyone was living. and. Um, relatives that were living came and picked up some of the kids and there's just no but the parents are living and so they're taking care of their kids so the orphanage was shrinking so it's very good news so no this has made a huge huge difference you don't see that kind of death and dying anymore it's really quite amazing yeah all over all over Africa yeah and they're getting the generic ARVs now, and it's it's really improved a lot. Yeah, it is. I think so. I think there's been some change in behavior. Yeah, um, with our psychosocial support groups, where they were for pregnant women that I that I started. Um, once you get the men in, it really is it's a nice success to bring the men into that group because they really are the decision makers in the in the home. Um, and uh, so yeah, we were starting to get quite a few more men coming in, but never got more than 15 percent, and they still were difficult to bring into the support groups to support their women. But um, I think the support groups really helped to um, destigmatize HIV AIDS. They became very strong and powerful women in the, in the support groups. It was kind of amazing to see the transformation once they, they come in. They are so shy, they don't want anyone to know. And by the time they finished their support group, they were pretty empowered women. It was kind of fun to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you for coming.